Uh, I want to welcome all of you to um, the fourth annual um, ACE Academic Center for Entrepreneurship Award Ceremony. My name is Bill Berardi and I am the director of the Academic Center for Entrepreneurship. And before I get started, there are some um, thank yous that I want to give. Um, first to Jeannie Girard, um, who is the ACE staff associate, and it's Jeannie's hard work and dedication that has brought us here tonight and has made this event a success, um, not only tonight, but in the past. I want to say thank you to Laura Carlson and the facility staff for their help in getting this area set up. And a thank you to all of our volunteers for their assistance. And I want to say to them, please understand that without your help, it would be very difficult for Jeannie and, and uh, Ace to pull this together. So thank you for your, all your help. Uh, some dignitaries that I know are here, um, BCC dignitaries anyway. I don't know if Sarah is here. Sarah? Garrett, Sarah Garrett is our chief academic officer and has been a supporter of ACE and, and um, for her help and assistance, I thank her very much. Dr. Mike Vieira, Associate Vice President of Academic Affairs. Dr. Mike. Um, again, his assistance has been invaluable. Um, and my dean, Dean Phoebe Blackburn, uh, again, whose assistance is very much welcomed by me. And I know um, I, I, Melinda Ailes is here. Melinda is the director of um, MSBDC for all you entrepreneurs. After you finish here with ACE, Melinda is a uh, valuable resource for you. Melinda, you, you there? There you are. Um, I've been here for three years, and one of the classes that I teach is management. I love to teach management. One of the reasons I love to teach management, and I've done it my entire life, but um, the four functions of management are uh, plan, organize, lead, and control. When I was an undergraduate, that was drummed into my head. So all of my students, and if some of you are here, I continuously drum, plan, organize, lead, and control. And I tell them that if they master those functions, they will be successful, and the department and the organization that they run will be successful. During my time here at BCC, I've had the pleasure of working with and for an individual who has mastered those functions, and as a result, BCC is successful. I now have the pleasure of introducing to you our president, Dr. Jack Sprager. Well, thank you, Bill, and good evening, everyone. What a wonderful night uh, to celebrate creativity and entrepreneurship. Uh, it's what we're all about. Uh, I want to welcome you to Bristol Community College. Some of you may not have been here before. Uh, <clears throat> just a little commercial. Uh, we're, we, there are 15 community colleges in the state of Massachusetts, and Bristol Community College is the third largest. Uh, so we have grown uh, through that entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, there are two in Boston with a larger population base, and then uh, Bristol Community College. We're very proud of what we've done. Our mission is to provide access and opportunity to a affordable, high quality education and uh, that's what you find at Bristol Community College. Uh, but this, uh, and this uh, event is really just part of the wonderful community services that we provide and you can see the uh, just some of the community partners that were introduced and there are others out there as well uh, who play a, a very important role with the Bristol Community College and the, the mission that we do in our activities. Um, this entrepreneurship uh, started, uh, uh, you know, with uh, Dean Phoebe Blackburn. Uh, had a presidential fellowship to begin work on entrepreneurship and uh, created the Academic Center for Entrepreneurship (ACE). Uh, and Professor Bill Berardi is uh, uh, also now taken over and uh, doing a wonderful work with the with this ACE. It's become a mainstay of the region, uh, and we're very proud of that. Uh, I mean, to have people. 
uh, just with an idea. Uh, you know, you hear the old uh, story about uh, Thomas Edison in a garage or in an attic or in a cellar somewhere with an idea and not really clear about how to promote it or what to do with it. And that's where the uh, Academic Center for Entrepreneurship comes in. You met Melinda in the Small Business Association, the Chamber, there's a number of uh, uh, <clears throat> entities in the community that will help and nourish uh, uh, these uh, people who have wonderful ideas but they're not sure how to translate it from the concept to the reality. And, uh, and that's the key in anything, isn't it, in this country. So uh, we're uh, very happy about the uh, entrepreneurship uh, activities. I want to congratulate the award winners. Uh, they have set sterling examples uh, for all of us in the community and in the region and the state. Uh, and we're very happy that uh, uh, Bristol Community College is a place where they can come and, uh, and be recognized and receive the awards that they so richly deserve. So I'm, uh, I'm ready to roll here, uh, Professor Berardi, if you want to... Uh, uh, move ahead. Uh, we are going to have, as I understand, uh, Mayor Scott Lyon is on the way. Uh, we hope that he'll be here. And uh, but in the meantime, we want to respect your time, and uh, maybe we can go forward with the uh, with the awards. Bill. Yeah, uh, we're still waiting for one re uh, for award sure. recipient. So, um, and and the mayor is is um, going to be here very shortly. So um, I, what I'm going to do is, um, you know, again, we're still waiting for one um, award recipient, and um, hopefully that person will be here very shortly. Um, so it, it is uh, Joe, uh, here's Joe. Uh, Joe Marshall um, is a former award winner um, from ACE. Uh, yeah, and, and, and a graduate of BCC. And Joe is uh, the um, founder of J. Marshall Associates, um, and he has agreed to help us out here with these presentations. So um, until the mayor gets here, I guess we'll go forward with the presentations. And, um, and when Monty gets here, we will give him his presentation at, at that time. So Joe. So he's, he's delayed, but I think he has very good representation here, whether you like it or not, Dale. <laughs> it's um, just to give you a little uh, background of where, where I'm coming from relative to uh, an entrepreneur, and as I've followed it over my last 35 years, an entrepreneur years ago was just hard work. You could get by with just hard work. You start a business, now you've got to be an accountant, you've got to be a lawyer, you've got to be in marketing. There's a lot more things you have to do now uh, to really be a successful entrepreneur. The hard work stays there though. You still need the hard work. Uh, places like BCC and, and other resources give you that. They give you the base and then you have to develop that base. So I I applaud the, uh, the entrepreneurs over the past four years that have received the award, but also the new ones here today. So with that in mind, again, respectful of time, the, the three entrepreneur um, categories, one was developing entrepreneur, the other was benevolent entrepreneur, and cornerstone entrepreneur. I am pleased to... Um, uh, to present the Developing, Developing Entrepreneur uh, Award to Beth Gallo. Uh, her company's name is Mad Hectic Oatmeal Company. To give you a little background on where Beth comes from, and, and this is the other thing, this is the fourth year, and I am amazed of, of the backgrounds of the people who, uh, um, it, you know, who, who succeed in these things. I mean, it's, uh, again, it goes back to the hard work, but I didn't even know these businesses were around, some of them. Beth uh, didn't set out to be an entrepreneur, uh, but she is the perfect symbol of one. She was a breast cancer survivor that just wanted to add more healthy food to her diet, preferably in the morning, but couldn't find a healthy breakfast food so she could get excited about it. So like many entrepreneurs before her, she recognized the problem and thought how she could solve it. 
She began making her own oatmeal with organic oats, dried fruits, nuts, and whey protein, changing the mixture over five years to suit her taste. And then finally, in 2008, she named her homemade recipe Mad Hectic Oatmeal, and she may be able to give you a reason for that name. And she designed this and uh, designed packaging with childhood photos of herself and, po and pigtails. The healthy, high-protein, delicious varieties span from almond pecan to chocolate raspberry to French chocolate as well as others. Now her oatmeal is sold in 38 locations across Massachusetts and Rhode Island, including three whole food market stores. With her family, uh, she hand mixes and fills, fills bags of oatmeal at the Commercial Grange Hall Kitchen in Dartmouth. And against all odds of starting a business in a tanked economy, she has seen steadily increasing sales and recently she received her first overseas inquiry for, whole container, for a whole container of mad, hectic oatmeal. Beth's entrepreneurial coverage is a local example of hope in very tough times and an excellent choice for the Developing uh, Entrepreneur Award. Beth? Come on. This is so unusual. I didn't expect to be here, believe me. Um, I often wonder why entrepreneurs do what they do. I mean, we know that challenges are there. We know you're going to lie awake in bed, calculating numbers. I've found myself holding up fingers, calculating things at night. And there's lots of physical strain, emotional stress and strain, and, and lots of challenges. But for some reason, we keep doing it. Um, and life gets more and more full. So my kids will attest to this. Lately, I've been going around saying, I just want a prize. I just want a prize. And so now I have one. So I appreciate it very much. Thank you. See, Beth, you got the award. I did. <laughs> yeah, you never, you really don't think about that when you work, go to work every day. The uh, Benevolent Entrepreneur Award is awarded to uh, Richard LaFrance, representing LaFrance Hospitality. And I know the family's here. Um, Richard is head of a three generation family that has owned and operated a steadily expanding group of restaurants banquet facilities and hotels, increasing jobs, sales, and community contributions on an annual basis be, uh, throughout Massachusetts and New Hampshire. The company's mission is to be the premier hospitality company by employing the very best people trained and empowered to deliver a quality product with sensational service to every guest every time. The corporate values are clearly stated and to include the importance of family and community. To give you some background, the business was founded in 1955 by Roland, Amy, and Mrs. LaFrance, Rita LaFrance, starting with a small family restaurant in Westport, Mass. In fact, if you want to hear the story directly from Mrs. LaFrance, go there for lunch, because she'll be more than happy to tell you the whole story. I mean that sincerely. Um, over the next 30 years, Whites of Westport expanded into a fine dining and banquet facility. In the 90s, with son Richard at the helm, the company began to open hotels, the first in Westport, followed by Fairhaven and Franklin Mass. The next addition was the acquisition of an upscale restaurant now known as Bittersweet Farms. Shortly thereafter, they acquired another banquet facility, which they call Rachel's Lakeside after Richard's daughter. Then two more hotels were built, one in Dover, New Hampshire, and one in Plymouth, and more recently one in, uh, one in New Bedford. This June is when the one in New Bedford was opened and is now, in, um, now operating successfully. And today there are three LaFrance La generations working in the business. The Community Cares Coupon Program, created by Richard LaFrance and co-sponsored by Pepsi, WSAR, East Bay Newspapers is in its 12th year. 
It's estimated that during its lifetime, the Community Cares Program has given over $250,000 to local worthy charities. As a result of these activities and many, many more, um, and actually there's a big list, uh, the Family Business Association awards its Massachusetts Family Business Award, awards highly prestigious Community Excellence Award for 2009, which goes to Richard LaFrance of the LaFrance Hospitality Suites. In 2009, the Massachusetts SBA awarded Richard the Jeffrey Butland Family Owned Business Award based on their, their success and commi commitment to the company. And in 2010, BCC is awarding Richard LaFrance the ACE Benevolent Entrepreneur Award. Richard, please. First of all, I'm very honored to accept the award, and really on behalf of my family. Uh, when I looked at and was told by Jeanie uh, calling me about the award and saying that it was a benevolent award, I was like, benevolent? Sounds like that's a combination of violent and good, and I was like, maybe that's because you keep banging your head against the wall doing things. It's like they'll give you an award for that. Then I realized, no, it was for, for, being, for doing good things, and then I figured, well, maybe I know Joe, I've known Joe, no, Joe a long time, and I thought maybe... He realized in 1957, when I played in four of a, uh, uh, the four of a Little League, Sneaker McDonald, who some of you may know, gave, uh, gave me the best conduct award. It wasn't the best hitter, the most valuable player. I, I got the best conduct uh, award, so I figured, well, how did I get that? Then I realized my dad and mom probably gave him a discount on the bank at White, so <laughs> it's a good award. But, um, so I'm, you know, I'm very proud of representing our family. family. You know, we, we do have a business run by a family. Uh, and you know the, the idea of this is to, is to really be in a position to help the community. Uh, we've been able to do that. We've we've had a successful business. Except we've had a successful. I'm very proud of a successful family situation where where, where I followed in my parents' footsteps. My children, uh, for the most part, uh, followed in, in 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 my footsteps. We work we work uh, together. Uh, as, as mostly all uh, situations happen, behind the scenes is always a good woman. So between my mom, who is here today, and that really started it all, and as Joe said, she is really the history of, of, of the Forva community. There was actually a gym about a mile away named in her, in, in her honor. Uh, so my parents show the support of the community that uh, I, I've uh, continued to be able to do. Uh, my wife obviously supports uh, myself and, and does all the other stuff. And, and, and it's really great. The next best thing is, it, it, well, the best thing is that it's great that it's succeeded to the next generation where, 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 where my children, uh, and today, you know, my son Chris is, is here, very, very involved with Junior Achievement, St. Anne's Hospital. We're very proud of St. Anne's Hospital. I don't want to go too long. I know we're maybe stalling for the speaker I, because I will take Monty's award too if he wants. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, we're very proud of the fact that, you know, it's, we, we've had a multi-generation. My dad was a board member of St. Anne's Hospital. I began, when he was ready to kind of, t you know, kind of move the, uh, uh, the baton, we'll say, uh, you know, I took that over. And then more recently, in the last couple of years, my son Chris has done that. So Chris is very involved. My son-in-law, Charlie, has been very involved in many organizations. I think he, he single-handedly ran the Westport Little League program. Uh, to the point we had hot, some of the, in the ba New Bedford Bay Sox, the mayor may probably won't say it, but the New Bedford Bay Sox, uh, he, was, he was home base for many of the baseball players at, at his house. And of course, we did name my, uh, my uh, the Rachel's Lake side after my daughter, uh, who was involved not, not in St. Vincent's for many, many years, helping in St. Vincent's, but now it, was, it works in the, in the local high school here at Durfee, So. Um, again, we're not going on time. You know, we're very proud of, of, of the community. We're very proud that we can support the community. We, we look to uh, enhance uh, the communities that we've had the privileges of, of going into. And, uh, and I just thank BCC for recognizing that. And again, I share that with uh, uh, my family and, uh, our, uh, and really our employees who are also make, what make, ha make it happen for us. So thank you very much, Joe. And
Thank you. Well, I want to recognize uh, Sarah Garretts here, the chief uh, economic officer for the, for the uh, college. She's a big part of this, too. She uh, keeps everything afloat. The uh, third award, I was going to make the comment, but it wouldn't be as much fun now because Monty's not here. But um, I think with having Richard and Monty, first of all, having Richard and Monty in the same room is awesome. But they probably have serviced 100% um, of, in one way or another, through a wedding or 100% uh, of the population of the greater Fall River area. And, uh, and I applaud both of them for, for doing that, doing a good job, too. The third award, and Dale, I'll look to you, please. The, uh, the third award, the Cornerstone Entrepreneur Award, um, will be awarded to Monty Ferris from the Venus de Milo and the Quality Inn. The success of the Venus de Milo restaurant in Swansea is legendary, and I think you've been reading it probably now over the last three months about the 50th anniversary. But it's a testament to the success of the local landmark. Founded by Mansour Ferris, the business grew. Monty and his late brother Ron were instrumental in the long-term growth of the business and together managed the business over the last 20 years. In 1992, Monty took over the operation of a 104-room motel, which was losing money and could not pay its rent. In one year, he turned it into a profitable operation, earning numerous awards from the fri franchisor Quality Inn. He upgraded the real estate, completely changing the look of the property to resemble the Quality Inn brand. Uh, he installed cutting-edge information and management reporting systems, reorganized management, launching a marketing program, and implemented employee management, evaluation, and reward programs. Under his leadership, he has increased the occupancy and never laid off any worker. In fact, the number of employees has steadily grown during his tenure. The property has constantly returned to profit. Um, there's a lot here, I'm 50 years worth. Um, in the late 2005, Monty launched a new enterprise, Jillian's, a sports bar and restaurant in Somerset. In less than 60 days, he conver converted a derelict operation into a pristine facility with a trained staff and superb pub menu. Uh, Monty identified, has identified and assembled the necessary capital assets and manpower to take, ch uh, take uh, advantage of opportunities. He has held his team to the highest standard for quality and service and has rewarded them accordingly. He has not laid off an employee during the worst recession since the Great Depression. I you hear a, a common thread here, I think, with, uh, you know, with the two award recipients and, and now with Monty, how the things that they've accomplished, they didn't just, you didn't just turn a page and have it happen. There was a lot of hard work associated with that. Monty gives the same intensity and dedication to his civic volunteerism and charities that he gives to his business. He has been recognized by then Governor Weld for his leadership role in tourism development for the South Coast region. He was recognized as the outstanding citizen by the Fall River Area Chamber of Commerce. Rich, you couldn't beat this one. <laughs> the entrance. <laughs> Uh, Richard, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Fall River Era Cha Chamber of Commerce for providing a lifetime of volunteer effort to a broad range of organizations, leading those organizations and providing a lasting legacy to the city and its region. Monty Ferris is a successful entrepreneur, a generous philanthropist, an impact volunteer, a good man, and an excellent choice for the Cornerstone Entrepreneur, uh, Entrepreneur Award for 2010. Monty. Timing was wonderful. <laughs> I got to get my blood pressure down. <laughs> we just uh, had an accident on the bag of bridge, and I said, I thought, I. Figured that would be the fastest way over here, but I guess not. Well, anyway, I'm very, very uh, deeply honored to be chosen uh, 
you know, for this year's uh, Cornerstone Award. And uh, special thanks to uh, the committee and to BCC uh, who is hosting this event. Um, you know, as it regards entrepreneurial initiatives, I'd like to just share with you a few of the fundamentals that I believe spell success when you're, you're involved with initiatives like that. I think first, you need a vision. And that vision, whether you're looking at an empty storefront, whether it's something that's uh, technical, mechanical, uh, scientific, whatever it might be. Sometimes it's a matter of beginning with the end in mind. It's very important that you think and plan well and list the objectives that will get you there while keeping in mind what those things may be that could prevent you from achieving those objectives. And there may be many. The process thereafter is a matter of, if I, let's say I can't solve an issue as easily as, to attain an objective as easily as another, to back burner or front burner it. It's a method that I use in not only measuring risk, but also in planning time management. Secondly, you need to have a great management team. And I've been blessed with some great people. In fact, part of that management team is here tonight, and I'd like you to introduce you to them. My property manager, Ken Andrade. Come on, Ken. You can. <laughs> My general manager, Meredith Morris, was not able to be here tonight. Uh, I believe we have Michelle Miner, she's our assistant manager. Uh, do we have Mike Kamara here? Okay, well those are our numbers crunchers. And these are the people who gather the good information that enables us to make good decisions. That's very, very important. Spend the time gathering information. Find mentors. And I've had two great ones in my life. One was my father, and the other one is my brother, my brother Ronald, who passed last year, and both of whom I miss deeply. Also, you know, remember, institutions have tremendous information. Institutions like BCC, UMass, and a lot of my initiatives in regards to real estate, uh, I learned an, a tremendous amount of great stuff up at MIT, uh, the Center on Real Estate Research and Development. Uh, as regards the hospitality business, I uh, spent some summers up at Cornell uh, in regards to issues in, in hospitality management. But our institutions are a wealth of information. Don't underutilize them. They're very, very important to your success. Uh, as for any further entrepreneurial initiatives for me, uh, right now, you know, my, the lion's share of my time uh, will be you know, steering the Venus through these economically difficult times. And I'm sure uh, Richard can attest to just how tough that is these days. Uh, but uh, I really appreciate the, uh, the honor and uh, to all of you, good luck to you, good luck to you. And uh, tap into great information. Make great decisions. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Again, I, uh, I want to thank the award recipients uh, for their contribution to the, to the community and their use of, uh, of BCC whenever possible. At this point, I'd like to turn it back over to Bill and uh, continue with the program.
And I was standing over there, and, and I was getting worried because um, there was an accident, bad weather, people weren't showing up. And Joe bends over and says, uh, whispers in my ear, um, don't worry, everything will fall into place. And uh, it has. <laughs> Congratulations to our winners, and, and please give them one more round of applause. Our keynote speaker I'd like to now introduce, um, Scott Lang, graduated from Marquette University in Milwaukee, Wisconsin in 1972 with a degree in history and political science. He attended Georgetown University Law Center in Washington, D.C. while working for the Democratic National Committee. He graduated from Georgetown in 1976 and was admitted to the Massachusetts Bar in 1977. Since 1990, he has lectured in various forums on employment issues regarding the Family Medical Leave Act, Americans with Disabilities Act, workers' compensation law, and other employment-related issues. He has contributed seven, several articles to the Massachusetts Continuing Legal Education in employ, um, employment um, and employment-related areas. He also has served as an arbitrator and mediator for the Commonwealth Mediation and um, Conciliation, Inc., and has sponsored numerous youth baseball teams as well as sports and academic programs throughout the city. With a strong history in civic engagement and public service, Scott Lang saw an opportunity to become even more involved in his community and entered the race for mayor of the city of New Bedford in 2005. Upon his election, Mayor Lang wasted no time in rallying the community and addressing the quality of life issues most important to city residents. It is my <coughs> pleasure to introduce our keynote, spoke, our keynote speaker, the Honorable Scott Lang. I appreciate very much the invitation to come uh, speak to these uh, young men and women who are involved in uh, small business entrepreneurship uh, programs and uh, to give you some uh, perspectives on what it is uh, like first to be a uh, small business owner, which I am, and then also to run uh, the biggest company in the city of New Bedford, which is the uh, city government. I also though want to uh, congratulate uh, Beth Gallo and uh, Monty Ferris and Richard LaFrance, tell you that I, I don't know Beth, but I've heard a great deal about her, and I, um, I'm going to try that oatmeal, I promise. <laughs> and uh, then Mr. Ferris and Mr. LaFrance, I have had the Pleasure knowing both of them for a long period of time, their families. I also want to tell you that uh, Richard LaFrance just recently expanded into the city of New Bedford with a uh, Fairfield Marriott Hotel, which is uh, overlooking the water, beautiful facility. We welcome him and his family. We really appreciate uh, their investment and confidence in the city. And Richard, thank you. And then I also want to tell you that Mr. Ferris, I have been uh, going in and out of uh, the Venus, I think, probably since uh, shortly after I uh, arrived to, to live permanently in the city, which is 1978. And uh, the soup tastes the same uh, to this day, and it's always delicious. I appreciate it. You always get a fantastic, uh, you know, fantastic reception at the Venus, and I know that so many people rely on it for so many different uh, functions or, or uh, you know, just as as you have with whites, you can go there and have a dinner. You don't need to go with uh, 400 people. You can go with your, your wife or spouse, uh, significant other. You're treated uh, as if you went out uh, for the finest dinner in the, in the country. It's very, very difficult to sustain businesses for that period of time. So the Ferris family and the France family understand how important it is to uh, concentrate on customer service and, and a good value, a, a good, good value for a dollar. And that, that's the key, I think, to success with with these uh, two great uh, hospitality institutions in our, in our area, so I want to thank them. Now, <clears throat> let me tell you uh, uh, some of my observations. First, as um, a small business owner and having a law practice, and then as, as again, the uh, person responsible for running a city, and then everything uh, in between that, I, that I've learned. First, 
uh, entrepreneurship is a very, very interesting concept, unique, uh, I think, to uh, capitalistic system and, and unique to American capitalism. What it does is, is provide the following, and you know it, you've been studying it. Uh, the first thing is you have to uh, have an opportunity that leads to a concept. So it's extremely important if there's an opportunity and you don't have a concept, it's not going to work. But if you, if you see an opportunity to provide some sort of goods or service, uh, then you have to have a concept as to how you uh, can be the individual that will uh, provide that good or service. Then you have to put together some sort of uh, an organization. Uh, you have to capitalize it, obviously. You have to put together an organization uh, and uh, you know, a plan with definite goals and, and the ability to uh, ascertain whether or not you're meeting those goals. To put a great team together. Uh, it may be yourself to start. You may look in the mirror each day and say, let's go team. But the answer to this is that you absolutely have to see an opportunity. Someone today comes to me and says, I think there's a great opportunity to restore eight track tapes. I'd say that opportunity came and went. Right? On the other hand, if you said, I think I have the next idea for an MP3 player or something like that, I'd say, let's sit down and talk. Let's, let's hear your idea. So it usually is a great idea. You also have to have a pioneering spirit. You have to be willing to take risk. Uh, I think each of the individuals that I heard speak for a minute used the word risk. Uh, if you're an entrepreneur, there is risk involved. Uh, there's a risk of your time, there's a risk of your effort, but in most cases, there's a risk of your capital or capital that you borrowed or capital that you brought partners in on. So you have to have uh, faith that you have the right idea, that you have to see the right opportunity, that your plan is correct, that you're able to measure your plan so that you don't go down one path and realize that you probably at the fork in the road should have taken another. Uh, but it's all very, very, uh, I think, achievable if you uh, stay hands-on. So I've never met too many people unless they really have a, a ton of money or able to say, well, I had an idea, I hired a few people, I said, call me in a month, tell me how it goes. So all of you, it comes down to rolling up your sleeves, being hands-on, watching, watching the day-to-day -day progress of your, of your plan and organization. And then the other thing is, uh, if you take the risk, you ought to, you ought to realize the reward. And I, I've had friends who've opened up different, different companies. One friend that opened up a bakery, their reward was that they took home anything that wasn't sold that day. And, and the fact of the matter was it took a long time before they actually got the reward of some sort of, uh, of profit. And the interesting thing is that you can say, well, you know, it's it a great little business. I, I pay myself a, a living wage. I work for myself. I love, I love what I do. I think it's building. I think that I've, I've created a niche. But that really isn't, isn't how you'll define profit. Profit would be not only your salary, but what's left at the end of the year or whatever your, your measurement is. Maybe it's a quarter. That's above and beyond that, that, that uh, in essence, rewards you for your risk. So it seems to me that if you have a business and you're able to, you're able to generate a, a salary out of it, that's great. But in the long run, you want a salary plus. You want to be rewarded for the risk. Because if you have the talent to set up your own company and draw a salary, I guarantee you someone else will hire you to do the same for them. So if you measure it in terms of how much you, you made week to week, it's probably not the, uh, uh, the best way to determine whether or not you're being rewarded. On the other hand, if your salary should be uh, $500 a week and you're taking home $5,000, you already received your uh, salary and reward. So it's not, it's not uh, uh, quite as easy as simply, as simply uh, uh, saying, well, I'll pay myself a fair salary and go from there. Uh, the last thing that I want to say about the entrepreneurship pioneering spirit is that now is a better time than any to find those opportunities and start those businesses. At the back end of a recession, as we begin to start a little bit of a recovery, uh, it is a dare to be great time. There's a lot of things uh, that, are, that are out there that favor you right now. One thing that favors you, I think, is uh, uh, cost of good services and uh, equipment, land, uh, there, there are a lot of great buys out now, right now, a lot of tremendous opportunities. The one thing that's very difficult is meeting the, uh, the requirements and factors perhaps that, that uh, banks may have in order to get a loan. Uh, that's something that you have to work uh, very, very diligently on to make sure that you put your numbers together so you can get that seed money. If you don't need uh, seed money from outside and you're able to put together uh, money you know, that you've, you've been able to save, uh, it might make sense in order to start to build up a line of credit or to build up credibilities, put the money in the bank and, uh, and see if you can get the bank to use that money literally as collateral as you draw down and draw and then put back on a line of credit so that when credit begins to ease, you've got a, you've got a great credit history. The other thing that I would tell you is there are a lot of opportunities in private-public partnerships right now. 
Uh, the state of Massachusetts has a lot of inducements to get businesses started to have people employed. There are a lot of apprenticeship programs. There are a lot of trade in and out type of programs regarding employees and training. So in other words, you put up 50 percent of an employee's salary, the government may pay X number of weeks of that salary in order for you to get a trained employee. The other thing that, that uh, we have are uh, <coughs> different tax incentives for businesses that create jobs. And they're strictly co controlled by the uh, state government or in some cases the federal government. But they're always worth, uh, worthwhile uh, inquiring about and it may give you a little bit of a bigger bang for the dollar. And every city and town in this state is trying to attract entrepreneurs, investors, individuals who want to start a business uh, under the, under the uh, condition that you hire people from our, from our cities or towns. So it's an, a great opportunity to take some money, put it on the barrel head, and turn it into uh, a great deal of uh, value as a result of having public partners. The other thing is that you may want to open up a small shop in a downtown area. There may be incentives for opening up the shop. There may be incentives for signage. There may be incentives to, uh, to begin on, uh, on outside facade type of work. So you should always check in and find out every available opportunity uh, that the government has, whether it's a lo local government, state government, or federal government, even if it's a tax credit from the federal government for buying a certain kind of equipment. The other thing is that you can make strong alliances with other organizations or other, other uh, businesses in the locality you're opening. So, for instance, you may go to the chamber and you find out that you get a great deal of uh, publicity and you get a great deal of, uh, of uh, you know, networking right off the bat. You meet that banker you need. You meet that lawyer you, you may need. And uh, there are many, in many cases, willing to help with uh, discounted uh, fees in order to get you off and running, looking at a long-term relationship. The other thing is that the media is always willing in an area to welcome in a new business and you can pump up your, uh, you know, your visibility. The local governments are always, we all have, now most of us have public access channels, so we're more than happy to roll out the, uh, the cameras and do a, a ribbon cutting with you and plug your business, plug your idea, plug the fact that you're looking for whatever it might be, uh, with the, again, the proviso that you're creating jobs, creating value for the specific, uh, specific area or city. Uh, the last thing is that there are, there are uh, infrastructure type of things that a, a company uh, looks for that a city or a town can do. You know, there, there's uh, things, sewer connections, there may be infrastructure water lines, there may be uh, sidewalks or specific road projects that can be done. There may be lines that can bur be buried or lines that be can be connected that the government legitimately can do because it's important uh, to bring in new businesses into a community. So there are so many different tools. You're never alone, you never go it alone. If you work with a good bank, the bank will push you towards the tools. If you have a good attorney, the attorney will push you towards the tools. If you come involved uh, with BCC and use uh, them as mentors, they'll push you towards the tools. But there are an awful lot of things that you can, uh, that you can capitalize on to keep your, to keep your company uh, first, uh, begin to, begin to uh, uh, found it and grow it, and then secondly, keep it viable. Now, I'm going to uh, just tell you a few, a few uh, observations that I've made during this recession that I think will hearten you, that will make you, uh, will make you feel uh, extremely, extremely uh, confident uh, in your own uh, abilities as well as confident in the risks that you'll take. And, and here's, here's what they are in a nutshell. There's a thinning out right now uh, around the country of, uh, of small businesses in, in just about every different area. And as uh, businesses thin out for whatever reason, vacuums are created. And it, it seems to me that uh, great ideas r right now at this, at this time uh, center around things that no longer are, uh, are available in different uh, localities. And that could be everything from personal service type of uh, uh, businesses to uh, things that involve uh, goods and services. But I think a, a well-founded idea based around things that people need. You know, you, it, it, it just is, is, a, is a heartbreak when someone comes in and says they're going to open up a hat shop. Because you look at it and say, I understand that, and if it was 1941, everybody in the city is going to wear a hat. But you better have more of, a, of a, uh, an inkling of how this is going to work out and what your customer base is going to be uh, than a hat shop. But right, but right now, I'm seeing uh, there's 
a tremendous, uh, a tremendous need from, from my perspective in uh, different goods and services in our downtown areas. Uh, the the uh, old model of urban living is slowly but surely coming back, but the services are not there any longer. And the fact is, as we see 21st century cities develop, you really are going to see uh, the need for a small uh, grocery store in a city like New Bedford or, or Fall River. Fall River has a very fine one, actually, that I can think of, but uh, not in every section of the city. But the cities uh, no longer have grocery opportunities. I constantly hear in New Bedford, can we get a small grocery store in downtown New Bedford? Now, a small grocery store means two for 39, not two for $1.99. You know, something, something that makes some sense that's, that's, uh, that's actually uh, affordable. Uh, I, hear, I hear on a regular basis people saying, and it, it sounds odd uh, right now to say this, but whatever happened to the place you can go for a cup of coffee and, and uh, you know, buy a book, like an old-fashioned bookstore in a place in an urban area. Now, you have to, I'm not suggesting for a minute that either of any of you go out and open up a grocery store but a, and a bookstore, but if you came to see me five years ago and said, there's a demand developing in New Bedford for a, an old-fashioned bookstore, whether used or new books, you know, which New Bedford always had. There's a demand for a small grocery store. I would have said, well, where would the demand come from? But, but the city inhabitants are growing now uh, by, I, I think, four times when I first took office. So as people move into a city, they want the amenities that a city will provide. And that may, in fact, be. I'm not sure what that what that is. I don't know if that means, you know, a, a, a personal services type of uh, businesses, or if it means uh, goods and and services. But that's up to you. But the the entire economics of a city and a downtown are changing, and I think people want, you know, some quality uh, in the in the uh, things that they're they're offered. As far as as far as the, uh, you know, where's it all going? 21st century. If you're involved in any kind of support services for uh, alternative energy research and development type of uh, support services, I think in this area of the state you'll do well. If you're involved in any kind of uh, uh, biotech uh, research and development or supplies, I think uh, in this area at some point you'll do uh, very well. I think that if you're involved in ocean type of activities or oceanographic type of activities, research and development, I think, I think that you will do well because I see those as major uh, areas that the government is going to be spending time and money on to bring down to this region, whereas we wouldn't have thought that uh, many years ago. The New Bedford Industrial Park has, has added 500 jobs since the recession started. New Bedford has opened up 40 businesses downtown in the last four years and 26 of them since the recession started. I mean, people are defying logic in, the, in this period of time and forging ahead. And, and I think this is a great time to, uh, to do that, to dare uh, with your great idea. Uh, I've, had, I've had everyone from people who say they're going to open up a cupcake uh, shop downtown to people who say I'm going to open up art supplies uh, to deal with the uh, students and the creative economy. I heard someone come in and say they want to take three storefronts, open them all up, and open up a small uh, movie uh, venue downtown. Uh, People talk about clubs, restaurants. We've opened up about 20 restaurants in the last two years in New Bedford. Uh, we've opened up support supply, uh, supply places for the airport. So I think it, it's a time now, if, you've, if you have a niche, if you have expertise, uh, it makes all the sense in the world. If you're involved in, uh, in, in anything to do with the environment, in the, anything to do with the remediation, anything to do with brownfields, New Bedford, Fall River, this area is perfect because I believe Federal money is going to be coming in for cleanups. So it's everything from semi-skilled to completely skilled individuals that will clean and then build the next great cities. I also find that, that uh, this whole weatherization issue right now is very interesting. There are no contractors out there that can team with the governmental programs. Uh, they don't have the expertise. They haven't put together the, uh, you know, the staff that they need to be able to take advantage of those programs. Uh, we've talked about uh, a number of solar programs coming down here. There's only one company that I know of right now that's certified to install solar. So it seems to me there's, there's a lot of opportunities. There's a lot of growth coming. You know, I, I expect we'll build a rail. You, you figure out a way to supply the spikes for the rail, you'll do very well. I had, an, I had an individual who went into the brick supply business, and in New Bedford we're using a ton of bricks, and they're selling a ton of brick all around the city. God bless them, good for them. If you can figure out a way to get a minority 
uh, or, or a woman's designation for your business so that you can take advantage of that. That's, that's a fantastic uh, opportunity. So there are plenty of opportunities out there. We're looking for people who create jobs, and I, and I think it certainly can be done. And I'll tell one last, one last uh, observation that, I, that I've learned. When I came in 78, uh, I, I came as a young attorney, and uh, the office that I joined represented about 25,000 working people. Many of them were in unions, but it was 25,000 working people. Over the years, uh, our office in, in, this, in this union sector is probably down now to two or 3,000 people, and we haven't, we haven't lost a union. It means that slowly but surely the unions, the unions left the area. Now, the people didn't leave the area. The unions left the area because the type of businesses that employed these individuals, one by one, uh, left New Bedford or Fall River. But the, the, uh, the goods that they produced did not go out of, uh, out of existence. The goods are still produced, but they're produced three, four, five, seven, ten thousand miles away. And then they're shipped back into the country uh, for, for a production cost of, say, one-tenth of what it would be to, to sell it in America. And there are American companies that have done this. This is no, no foreign country figured out a better way to build a widget. The thing was that American technology went overseas, hired people instead of for, you know, 15, 20, 30 dollars fully loaded, hired them for three dollars fully loaded. And then you'd say, well, and then they built, they built this, uh, this particular product. So you'd say, well, if they built it for one tenth the, co the cost, then it means that when they sold it, make, making the United States, for 100 percent, it should now be 15 percent or 20 percent of the cost. Well, the answer was they sold it for 95 percent. Just enough to have people continue to buy it and just enough to begin to fold the other American companies that were still there that were selling it for that 100 percent figure. The fact was that the profit just grew exponentially. The profit just went out, out, of, uh, out of sight. So we know we've had a job drain. A drain. The jobs haven't, haven't left the world. They left the U.S. So during this recession, we have a company in New Bedford that's 100 years old that has been a, a tremendously nimble company that has had a profit every year since it started. Some years may be a penny, other years it may be, you know, several million dollars. Employs about 250 people and makes a product that I think uh, directly, directly uh, affects our national defense capabilities. It's a product that's used in airplanes, used in cars, used in trucks, used in military equipment. It's a product that when you look at it and you saw it, you wouldn't even understand what it was. In fact, you might laugh and, and think, I'm not quite sure what this thing is. But it is, it is a very, very resilient product that's used in any combustible engine, and, and you absolutely have to have it to fly jet planes or missiles or anything else. Uh, during the recession, they had a very, very small uh, line of credit with a bank from outside the area, a national bank from outside the area. And uh, as things got tough and as orders declined from, a, from an auto standpoint, the company, the company began to lose its volume, began to lose its, uh, its, its uh, daily sales. So cash flow slowed down, and the company, which had 250 people, had to begin laying off people in order to make ends meet, which makes sense. You have to be like an accordion. You have to be flexible. You have to be very, very quick on your feet. They caught it in time, and they began laying off people, laying off people that were long-term employees that they said, as soon as we can, we'll take them back. So their line, let's say they do uh, $25 million worth of business a year, and that's a hypothetical, and their line of credit was about $750,000 that this particular bank called one day and said, we want, we want our line of credit paid. We see you're laying people off. We see your sales are going down. We see what's known as the factors indicating that you're going to have some trouble. And we need our $750,000 back right away. And the bank, uh, the, the bank said, we'll give you a deadline of about two weeks. Well, $750,000 in a great economy is a lot of money. In a very bad economy, economy is extremely, extremely difficult to raise. And what they did, the bank, the, uh, the different people who worked at the place started throwing money on the table, what they, you know, what they could come up with, the different, the different uh, managers. And they were maybe able to come up with, with collateral, including putting their houses on the line, maybe $200,000 $200, to beat back this demand. Bank said, that's not good enough. We want, our, we want our money. National Bank, completely amorphous. You wouldn't know if they came in right now and looked at them, you wouldn't know who they are. They don't know us. We don't know them. But someone looking at it, Looking at the numbers, 
crunching the numbers and saying these factors don't add up. They don't, they don't add up. They can't, we can't do this. So the, the bank then called the company and said, we have very good news for you. This is all going to get resolved. It's pretty, pretty simple, pretty easy. We have found a buyer for the company from Germany. And they're willing to pay. And, and the price, if the company was worth, if, again, hypothetically, $50 million, they were willing to pay, say, $45 million in the recession. Not, not a bad price. But who would want to sell the company, right? The company was like a, just laying that golden egg each year for 100 years. And uh, the company said, we're not for sale. They said, well, we are going to call the note next week and force the sale. We're going to send over the people who are interested in buying it. You'll pay us back. You work out your best deal with them. So the company called myself and, and some of our elected officials in Washington and said, does this make any sense to you? Just if it makes sense to you, we're not going to question it. I guess this is America today. But a bank who's looking for such little money when it comes to how long this company has, has been in existence and what it does for the country and, and how much it produces each year, you know, say $25 million in sales, and they want their seven fifty. Does this make any sense to you? And the answer was simply this. We're about to sell these 250 jobs to uh, Germany. They're going to take the technology. They're going to take the equipment. They're going to build this in Germany now. How does this make any sense? This is, another this is another manufacturing industry that's about to go to a company, the country that's an ally of ours today, but who knows if it'll be tomorrow. And when we need these parts, we're going to be having to deal with them to get them because there's only two places in the country that, that makes them, our, our place and a place in California. So when it, when it came down to it, uh, we ended up having a meeting with the bank uh, down in Washington. And the president of the bank, who um, literally the president of the bank, this is, in other words, I, I'm on. I'm on one. Uh, you know, I'm on one pay scale, one level of authority. The president of this bank, that is a national bank all over the country, is on on this level from the standpoint of what he thinks his responsibility is. But I believe my responsibility was a lot was a lot more serious than his on that day. He came in. He had a meeting, and he explained to us in, in the most dignified terms the reason that we're doing this is because this company doesn't meet the factors. And, and the only explanation or the only thing I said back to him was, let me make sure I understand this. About two months ago, the article in the Wall Street Journal, the article in the New York Times, the article in the Standard Times, the Fall River Herald News, said that your bank didn't meet the factors and we just gave you $100 billion across the banking industry so you would meet your factors. And now, you're, now what you're doing is coming to a place like New Bedford and saying, you guys don't meet your factors. You're going to sell your, your business to these guys in Germany. You're going to lose these jobs, and we'll get paid. That's not how we're going to build an economy. So, so what the bank did, and very, very shortly thereafter, was pull back and say, you know what? We're going to give you a year to get this straightened out. And, and this company then went ahead, uh, is now a year later, rehired all its workers, plus 30, is doing more business than it's ever done before, kept the jobs in New Bedford, went from down to 175, back up to 280, and paid off the bank in about 20 minutes with a note that said, you know, thanks very much for your consideration for the year, uh, but we learned a good lesson here, right? You got to know who you're dealing with. You got to know your banks. You got to know the people that you trust. You're going to put your heart and soul in an investment. Make darn well sure before you sign anything that they have the same interests that you do. There's nothing like the community banks. There's nothing like a national bank that has community representatives. There's nothing like, there's nothing like uh, a community representative who understands your product, understands the people you hired, and believes in you as much as you believe in the company. So that was, that was a very, very good lesson right then and there. What it comes down to it is the only way you protect your business is you protect, uh, you know, you protect uh, uh, the people who work for you. So uh, good luck with this. You want to come see New Bedford, we'd love to have you. And, um, uh, I, I admire all of you. Get in, go, go out there and, uh, and start the next great company. Thanks. Uh, those are some ins inspiring words, <coughs> at least from my perspective. But that last, that last story, um, I guess tells you or gives you some idea of the impersonal business that, that's out there. The one thing I can tell you, and I'm going to be a little bit selfish here because I believe in what we do here at BCC. I believe in what ACE 
why ACE was started, and I believe in, in the good work that, that we do at the Academic Center for Entrepreneurship. I congratulate these um, award winners, but those of you who may be sitting in the, uh, in the audience, students, community um, uh, people who may have an idea, I urge you to come and, and talk to us. Our contact, contact information is in the back of the book. Um, we have some mentors that, that have been in business for many, many years. Um, I can relate to the mayor's story because I was a banker for 35 years. And, and not only was I a banker, but I was one of those lenders that he talked about. Um, and now I've come to an industry where I can impart the knowledge that I have and I can give to you um, who have that idea. So please come and see us. Use the resource. It's valuable. And um, quite frankly, we don't charge you a whole lot for it. Take my experience for what it's worth to you and start that business that is going to um, bring this economy further out of recession. I said once when I was asked to quote, I said, it's entrepreneurs that made this economy great and it's entrepreneurs that will keep it great. It's you people that, that give us the jobs that we are seeking and looking for. Um, now, as I say to most of my students, before I let you go, and they all sigh, they don't chuckle, they sigh, but um, I want to thank some, some people that um, have contributed time and um, um, the food that we're going to, and beverage that we're going to be um, enjoying shortly. Um, again, entrepreneurs. Um, Raphael, you've seen Raphael running around here taking pictures and, and uh, um, Time Stop Studios. He's um, a wonderful photographer and, and I thank him uh, for what he's done for ACE and for this um, event, not only today, but in years past. Beverages have been donated by Narragansett Brewery, Coastal uh, Roasters, and Pepsi Cola. Uh, hors d'oeuvres, uh, not your average Joe's restaurant, uh, the, Black, uh, the Back Eddy restaurant, Blount Seafood, and um, this afternoon I was running around picking up um, things for, for this event, and at the uh, Venus de Milo, the, the wonderful gentleman that I went to see um, to pick up some bags, he said, this is the greatest soup in the world, and if you haven't had it yet, then I'm, I'm sure you'll agree with that. In the desserts, um, Chef John Carissimo, who I saw over there uh, just, just recently in the Bristol County Culinary Department, is providing the, uh, the sweets, that chocolate fix that I know you all want. Um, and I thank, I thank them. And, and, and if you haven't tasted the, the culinary um, desserts and, and the food that we produce here, you're in for a treat. So again, Chef, if you're there, thank you very much. And um, let's eat, drink, and be merry. Thank you very much for coming.